Hello and welcome to Freewave TV. I'm Paige Friedman, bringing you the latest in maritime news from around the world. Today in maritime news, Felix Tau strike poses new concerns for the UK supply chain. Shipyards report losses as new report indicates new build prices will remain firm. Spikes for demand in container shipping during the pandemic set to go back towards normal. APM terminals wins bid for acquisition and swap. Antong Holdings and CU Lines partner to establish new trade lanes. Hopog Lloyd to upgrade fleet during the next five years. Port of Oakland to develop zero emissions operations. On Sunday, nearly 2,000 workers at the Port of Felixstowe stopped work as they went on the first day of their eight-day strike. With the strike start, the UK has seen more issues to the supply chain, and the British media is even showing pictures of empty store shelves. Carriers like Maersk and Costco have announced they won't be calling at the UK. Carriers are also anticipated to offload cargo in other ports like Antwerp or Rotterdam, which will cause even more congestion to the ports. Data from Sea Intelligence indicates that about 11,000 20-foot equivalent units a day will be impacted by the Felix Dow strike. While order books for new ships are growing and prices are going up, major shipyards are still reporting losses. In Asia, many shipyards are seeing an increase in the cost of labor, which is a significant portion of the cost of building a ship. A report from Clarkson's research stated that firm steel prices, wider inflationary pressures, and depleted slot availability at shipyards are all indicators that new build prices will hold steady for now. During the COVID-19 pandemic, demand had spiked, which resulted in record earnings for container shipping. However, a new analysis from Sea Intelligence indicated that those spikes are history. The analysis concluded that volumes are slipping, and the only reason rates are being propped up is due to the supply chain. During the pandemic, global demand was consistently at a level 10% higher than capacity, but now it is down to 2% when compared to pre-pandemic levels. Sea Intelligence predicts that the supply and demand balance will continue to decline and freight rates will be under increasing downwards pressure as there has been some improvement in schedule reliability and in vessel delays. In other news, a court confirmed that APM Terminals was the official winner of a bid for the acquisition of an isolated productive unit of Estelero Atlantico Sol in the port of Swap Pernambuco. APM Terminals is set to invest up to $50 million in the new container terminal, and the company's goal is to finish construction within 24 months after obtaining the permits. APM will also consider a design for the facility to be net zero emissions. The port is expected to be fully operational by the end of 2025. Andong Holdings, controlled Anshang Shipping, has joined forces with China United Lines to deploy 12 ships onto the Trans-Pacific and Asia-Europe trade lanes. This is just another example of a Chinese liner expanding from its domestic routes to main east-west trades. Hapag Lloyd has kicked off a program to upgrade 150 ships in its fleet over the next five years. In the upgrades, there are plans for at least 86 ships to be equipped with new propellers. 36 vessels will receive a new flow-optimized bulbous bow. Other modifications will happen during scheduled dry dock stays. The upgrades to the ships are also going to help the company achieve its goal to be climate neutral by 2045. In the United States, the Port of Oakland plans to make its operations zero emissions. The port is set to spend $2 million developing clean energy at the facility. The project features electrical infrastructure, including solar generation, battery storage systems, a fuel cell, and the replacement of a substation and connecting circuitry. The port also hopes to switch to all electric, heavy-duty trucks and cargo handling equipment. And now, here's the news making headlines around the world. The head of Ukraine
Ukraine's Security and Defense Council, Alexei Donilov, said that he anticipates Moscow orchestrating a series of terrorist strikes in Russian towns after claiming in a series of tweets posted in both English and Ukraine that support for the conflict is falling in Russia and that the Kremlin needs popular mobilization. He finalized his accusations by prefacing that the attacks could result in mass casualties among civilians. Something that may have nudged Ukraine's Security and Defense Council to assume more Ukrainian blame was the car bomb attack that killed Daria Dugina, daughter of an ultra-nationalist, on the outskirts of Moscow. Ukrainian officials have ridiculed Russia's accusation that special services were behind the killing. Analysts speculate that Alexander Dugin, the victim's father, was the target of the killing. President Putin condemned the vile, cruel crime and posthumously awarded Ms. Dugina the Order of Courage. A memorial service for the 29-year-old took place in Moscow on Tuesday. While Ukraine is fighting to keep its name clean, Lithuania's foreign minister said on Tuesday that Russia's neighbors, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Finland, may stop Russian tourists from entering their countries if the European Union does not enact a union-wide ban. Russians mostly enter the European Union through the listed five countries since direct flights between Russia and the bloc were suspended following the invasion. Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, spoke out against such a restriction, saying that Russians should be free to leave their native nation if they disagree with Kremlin policy. Meanwhile, other countries believe that Russian tourists shouldn't be able to travel to Europe as their nation carries out genocide. While the European Union looks into travel bans, Taiwan is calling China out for crossing clear boundaries again. On Tuesday, Taiwan's defense ministry said 20 Chinese aircraft and four Chinese ships were detected operating around the independent island, including five aircraft that Taiwan claims crossed the Taiwan Strait median line. China has carelessly and ceaselessly been carrying out drills near Taiwan since U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced her visit, despite strong objections from the government in Taipei. Kenya's Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission revealed that an organized group of goons wielding crude weapons were located and taken off the premises. The August elections in Kenya came with a division and ended with nine election petitions getting filed, including one by opposition leader Rayla Odinga that was filed at the Supreme Court on Monday. The IEBC is a respondent in all election petitions and will conduct itself accordingly. As government officials question the sanctity of their government, about 2,000 anti-government demonstrators gathered outside New Zealand's parliament on Tuesday with a myriad of grievances. Some are calling for freedom, while others protested over a span of issues, including tighter environmental regulations for farmers, a government bid to take over regionally owned water assets, and now largely removed COVID-19 restrictions. In an effort to combat the homophobia, racism, and alleged misinformation coming from the far right on Tuesday, roughly 250 counter-protesters also assembled. Barriers were erected in front of Parliament, and there was a heavy police presence around the grounds. In other news, former Prime Minister Najib Razak began his 12-year prison sentence after being found guilty on charges related to a multi-billion dollar graft scandal at state fund one Malaysia development Berhad on Tuesday. Investigators claim that over $1 billion flowed to accounts connected to Najib and that around $4.5 billion was taken from 1MDB, which he co-founded during his first year as Prime Minister in 2009. His wife, Rasma Mansur, is also facing corruption charges. A court official and sources close to Najib said he was taken to Kajang prison about 40 kilometers away from the capital Kawala Lumpur. A story that's hard to forget is that of Jagtar Singh Johal. It was 2017 when his family claimed Johal was escorted into an unmarked car in India, taken into custody, and continuously tortured. Many prime ministers have scouted the Indian government on his treatment, but India's government continuously denied he was tortured or mistreated. The Indian authorities say the charges are related to Sikh nationalism, whereas Johal was an active blogger and a campaigner for Sikh human rights. This week, a new puzzle piece was found by human rights group Reprieve, with evidence that his arrest followed a tip-off from British intelligence. 
The UK government refused to comment on an ongoing legal case. Continuing down the path of a seemingly skewed government, on Monday, former President Donald Trump, who is being investigated for potentially mishandling documents, requested a federal judge temporarily halt the FBI's review of the 11 sets of classified files. Today, in a Florida court, Trump filed a 27-page lawsuit against the Justice Department, where his legal team accused the Justice Department's search as an effort to thwart Trump from running for election again. Trump has denied any wrongdoing and said the items collected were declassified. Indian police arrested state lawmaker T. Raja Singh from Prime Minister Narendra Modi's party on suspicion of promoting hatred in the name of religion on Tuesday, following calls for his arrest from Muslim organizations for his remarks against the Prophet Muhammad. The video available on social media illustrates Singh referencing to the Muslim Prophet saying that he married a girl decades younger than him. Singh could not be reached for comment. After videos of Finnish Prime Minister Sana Marin partying with friends by singing and dancing at a house party sparked concern about the young Prime Minister's abilities to do her job, it has been announced that after a series of apologies and drug testing for her own legal protection, her results have come back with no narcotics in her system. The grain sea lows destroyed in a significant bomb in Beirut in 2020 have fallen in its northern part. Two other parts fell in late July and early August, approximately two years after the explosion in the Docklands that occurred on August 4th, 2020, which killed over 200 people. Luckily, there were no injuries reported in this recent collapse. Taking a turn for the best is Singapore. On Sunday night, groups of gay Singaporeans and their friends gathered across the nation to watch Prime Minister Lee Hazien Long repeal the controversial 377A law and effectively legalize homosexuality. As some cheered, others were grounded with Long's next statement. His government would protect the definition of marriage as one between a man and a woman, ruling out the possibility of marriage equality for now, since most Singaporeans do not want a drastic shift. This move puts any decision on gay marriage firmly in the hands of the government, not the courts. We're now going to take over to Jean-Louis. He's going to share what's going on in the sports world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of Free Wave TV. As always, it's Jean-Louis. And from the States to across the pond, here are your sports stories from all over the globe. We start off today in football, where the Ukrainian leagues have officially resumed. The first game played was Shankar Duncek versus Medalist 1925, where the teams each played to a draw, a contested day after months of inactivity. We have some other games on tap throughout the league, as today in the EFL, a list of teams such as Everton, Ashton Villa, Crystal Palace and Brentford all are in action today. The FA Cup also has a host of games on tap today. However, the biggest games emanate from the Champions League, where at three, Benfica take on Dynamo Kaviv, Red Star Belgrade take on Maccabi Haifa, and Victoria Palzen take on FK Karabakh. In cricket, an international 2020 match is underway between the under-19 teams Sri Lanka and England. Now, at the time of recording, England leads Sri Lanka by 24 runs with nine rickets remaining. In the 100 series, the Oval Invincibles are taking on Birmingham Phoenix, where the women, of course, are first up. As with the Invincibles yet to bat, Birmingham Phoenix are 37 for one with 61 balls left. The men will commit in the following matchup to complete out the day. The Royal One Day Cup is also taking place with a host of games as we speak. Lancastershire and Durham are in action right now with Lancastershire needing 163 runs to win from 42 overs. For the rest of the scores, stick over to Free Wave. As the Cincinnati door closes, the door for the U.S. Open opens wide up for all of our athletes of tennis lore. Today marks day one of the three-week bonanza as qualifiers are underway today. American stars Ethan Quinn and Ernesto Oscabero face off at 11 as well as number one ranked Anna Bogdan and Anna Lena Friedman on the women's end. 
Stars such as Alexander Zarev and Riley Opekla will each miss the Open due to injury. With news looming over September's President's Cup and the world number one Scotty Scheffler's debut inside it, we all have eyes on the Tour Championship, where the lineups have been announced. The aforementioned Scheffler would start at 10 under, with Patrick Chantley, who won another thriller at the BMW Championship, will enter as the two seed. The rest of the list includes the likes of Roy McIlroy and Jordan Spieth. The event kicks off on Thursday. Following Kamaru Usman's upset title loss against Leon Edwards this past weekend, Khabib, a former champion in his own right, spoke to MMA Shorts about what's next for the welterweight. He mentioned in the interview that with Edwards avenging a past loss to Usman, a trilogy is in the works for the two. And while he's confident in Usman's chances in the match, he questions his future overall, citing that a knockout of that magnitude, a lot of people don't necessarily recover. Usman's loss was the second in his MMA career. In baseball, the lighter fluid for the Subway Series seems to be back in stock, as after yesterday's 4-2 loss against the Yankees, the Mets look to rebound tonight at 7. The NL East best will have a go without their star pitcher Jacob deGrom, as with the year nearing its end and the pitching rotation dealing with injury already, they will rest him until Thursday or Friday while they face off the Colorado Rockies. Tiwan Walker, who is also dealing with lingering issues, is starting in today's matchup. NBA Hall of Famer Dennis Rodman is back in the news today. As after his interview with NBC News, the five-time champion is set to go to Russia in hopes to help the WNBA star Brittany Griner return home. The news has not gone over well with the White House, with State Department spokesman Ned Price stating, quote, we believe that anything other than negotiating further through the established channel is likely to complicate and hinder those efforts. Rodman is, of course, no stranger to, to approaching government officials overseas, as the 61-year-old has had numerous interactions with the likes of Kim Jong-un, the supreme leader of North Korea. Lastly, on this date with history, we stick with hoops, as in 1978, the Black Mamba was born. The NBA's late great Kobe Bryant played 20 seasons in the association, winning five championships, two scoring titles, and an MVP nod, while being nominated as an NBA All-Star eight times. The Laker legend, of course, had a global impact worldwide, as well as his impact within the youth basketball community, in particular for women. With a lifetime of moments that brought euphoric joy, we were unfortunately brought to us a moment of sadness when Bryant, alongside his aspiring basketball star daughter, Gianna, were killed in a plane crash back in January of 2020. He will surely be missed, and he was being 44 years old as of today. That is all we got for you guys today. As always, I am Jean-Louis. Stay locked and loaded to Freewave and all of our socials for updates, insight, and more. Until then, you have a good one. That's all we have for today. For more detailed news, you can visit our website www.freewavetv.com.
On behalf of all of us here at Freewave TV, thanks for watching, and we'll see you at our next newscast. Thank you.